And welcome back to You Were Joining 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Regina that I think that you should know. And today we're going to be talking about another logical fallacy. This is uh, one of many logical fallacies we've talked about, uh, but this one is a little bit special in that uh, it's it can be interpreted to be uh, a little bit more complicated than a mere logical fallacy. And I learned about this in university uh, as a logical fallacy, and it when I learned it, it was just something to avoid. And certainly in the research that I've been doing for this video, I've learned a little bit more about it. Uh, so we'll get into exactly what as we go here. But the basic idea, as you can kind of see the guy falling down here, uh, is in analogy to a slippery slope. So you start with uh, some premise up here uh, that is probably going to happen, and then A leads to B, some other event that could happen, contingent upon A, and then B leads to C, C leads to D, and then somewhere down the road you lead to Z leads to hell. And of course we don't want to go to hell. Uh, hell has been described by Christians as this kind of unpleasant place where you can enjoy the company of such great thinkers as, as Nietzsche and uh, Socrates, uh, but you, you, you probably want to avoid going there in general. So we don't want to go there, so the, the argument, the slippery slope argument is, well we shouldn't go to A, because A leads us to hell, and we don't want to go to hell, therefore not A. Or And this doesn't have to be uh, a, a completely certain thing. Uh, it can be framed in probability, so that uh, in all situations where A happens, uh, it increases the probability that B happens, and B increases the probability that C happens, and so on and so forth, until we get to, you know, Z increases the probability that we go to hell, and we don't want to go to hell. So therefore, we don't want to even start at A. And so, really, we're, 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 we're in this situation where, similar to the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, where we're kind of hitting up against the boundaries of what it means for something to cause something else. Uh, what, what exactly we're, we're intending or, or we, we can act upon to have this kind of causal relationship between many different things. Uh, there, there's a, a kind of an old saying, something of, of the form, you know, for want of a nail, the horseshoe was lost. For want of a horseshoe, the horse's leg collapsed. For want of a leg, the horse was lost. For want of a leg, or want, want of a horse, the rider was lost. For one of a rider, you know, the battle formation was lost, and so on and so forth until you get to the, you know, the kingdom is lost, uh, and the, the empire is lost. And so you, you can go from very, very small things that are practically insignificant to very, very large things in a hurry, in the right situation, especially if we're looking back on it in retrospect, kind of as we did with the Texas Sharpshooter, where we, if we, if kind of pin down the, the cause in the wrong way, we may end up just kind of drawing a target around a cause without really uh, including all of the other things that were going on in kind of a, a way that would guide our action as we live our lives. And, and just like a real slope, uh, if you start a ball rolling at the top of the hill, uh, you need only a small push to get it to start moving fast enough that it'll hit the bottom. And so the, the analogy is, of course, that you don't want to start the ball moving. And it really depends, uh, in terms of what we're talking about, how, sleep, uh, how slippery the slope is, and whether or not this is kind of uh, worth considering. This logical fallacy is related to a lot of the other things, as we've kind of mentioned with the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Uh, but other things it's related to include the argument to emotion. Because we fear hell, we fear getting to the bottom, and fear is something that, as mentioned in previous videos, kind of shortcut our reasoning ability to the point where we make poor decisions. And the think of the children, children are usually at the bottom here somewhere, where we're worried about these people who can't defend themselves, and so we, we kind of try to backtrack our way up the, the chain of causality enough that we don't have to worry about them. It's related to the two to the third, or, you know, video number eight, uh, in, in that this often enough has to do with exponential change. Uh, it doesn't have to deal with exponential change, 
parabolic change or cubic change or uh, anything really above uh, kind of a line, or even in this case, a, just a linear change, will all work. Uh, but exponential change is a little bit of a special case because it can get out of hand very quickly. And you can deal with probabilities that do not go up very quickly, but nevertheless lead to these kind of disastrous outcomes if exponential change is involved. And unfortunately, exponential change is involved with many things in life, both in terms of human activity and in terms of the natural world. It's related to the argument of the beard. Uh, because there is, at any given point on this line, on this slope, uh, you can zoom in really, really fine detail and find that you're still on a slope. And we'll talk about this, among other things related to this, when we get to the derivatives video. Uh, but the point here is that this does not necessarily always have this really discrete uh, stages that you can look at and point to. More often than not that, you'll get to a slope no matter how far you zoom in, and there's always ways to move up or down that slope. So the question is, is how likely are each of these premises, are each of these different stages on this slope? How likely are you to be at any point in the slope, whether or not you're already tumbling down it? That is something that you should be asking. Uh, and how sure of it are, are you that you're in that stage? That's another thing to be noting. If you suspect that you're either making a, a slippery slope argument, or your opponent is making a slippery slope argument, or you even just suspect you're on a slippery slope of some kind. Lawyers apparently use slippery slopes uh, more often than not because part of their role, their job, is often to get you from point A to some other point. Uh, and they don't necessarily have all the resources in the world to do it uh, and all the time in the world to do it. And so they'll kind of drag you down this slope if they can make one. It is said that, quote, all politics takes place on a slippery slope. And there's probably good reason for that. Uh, in that the, the, the world that we live in uh, often enough has kind of is defined by our uh, view of it. Uh, it's not, of course, entirely defined by our view of it. There is an external world that we live in and that we have to abide by its rules uh, and the rules of physics and the universe as, as we know it. Uh, but to a large extent, uh, especially in politics, uh, there's a lot of processes that can take place where the, the, the change can happen in a kind of increasing uh, detail, uh, which we'll get into as we go. Now, the, the problem here, and the reason that it's kind of viewed as a logical fallacy, is that instead of dealing with the, the situation here and, and, and discussing the merits entirely in terms of the pros and cons, the costs and the benefits of this A, this first thing that we're probable uh, to, or probably, or that we're going to probably encounter, uh, we end up dealing with this extreme hypothetical that's out of our uh, ability to observe, it's out of our ability to kind of test often enough, and sometimes we don't even have the probabilities in between to really measure it or to, to gauge how likely it is. And so the shift happens from this uh, place that's very concrete, this place that we can deal with in a, an immediate way, to this very, very distant thing. And that's where the problem comes, because often enough, that distant thing is so far from our experience that we don't have a, a good enough grasp to really judge whether or not it will or could have an impact in the right way. And if you just discuss things that are purely hypothetical and ignore the benefits and costs in the immediate sense, then realistically you're not discussing uh, what, what could or should happen. You're just discussing things that you're imagining could happen uh, that are s distant enough that have no impact or almost no impact at all. And that there is unlikely impact uh, in general. And uh, another problem with that is that it's unfair when you're in an argument to expect your opponent to have to defend their weakest part, but for you to only have to defend your strongest part. And this is something that's going to happen when you're discussing a slippery slope often enough, because you're going to be defending something on this side where you can have a, a meaningful statement or a meaningful way of 
using or interacting with it, and your opponent may be forced to, to kind of deal with this and only kind of defend the, the absolute worst consequences, uh, and it, you're, you're kind of on an uneven playing field, as it were. Uh, and so not, not only is this just not fair uh, in kind of person-to-person -person discussion, but it's not fair in kind of a logical sense, in, in terms of you're, you're trying to, to learn whether or not it's a good idea to, to do A, or to, to have an event A happen. Uh, and you're not, I guess, taking into account uh, information in a balanced way that really informs whether or not you should do A. And worse than just it being unfair, often enough, it's incredibly unlikely. Uh, now I'm not going to go through the entirety of probability theory with you here, uh, but it's worth pointing out that every step that you go, by, def or by the, the laws of probability itself, has to be less likely than the previous step. So if this has a 99% chance of happening, this has to be less than 99, it could be 98. 97, and then we get all the way to the bottom, and we're at like 0.00001%. Now, that may be a horrible, horrible place to be, and we want to measure how bad it is and how unlikely it is when we come up to the, the, the decision of whether or not we should do A. Uh, but there's a way to do that, and it isn't necessarily going to be purely by ignoring the chance that any of these things happen, and mer merely uh, deciding based on the, the magnitude of the outcome or how bad the outcome possibly is because this could be so unlikely that it has almost nothing to do with our initial condition and we'll get into examples of that as we go. And so a, a lot of the times, a, a, as I've kind of pointed out here, this is kind of really abstract, it's, it's kind of, we're, we're off in the balloon somewhere, floating around, not even dealing with real life at all, uh, but unfortunately we, we end up doing that a lot anyway. So if you're already at the point where you're dealing with abstracts and you're, you're dealing with kind of this um, you know, highfalutin uh, simulation of, of the world rather than something that you could actually measure or something that you could actually experience, you know, then I guess y you can start looking at doing this in a valid way. Uh, but just be aware that if you have the ability to measure the outcomes or to, to gauge the probability, you should be doing that, uh, and you can get closer uh, to uh, the top of the slope and kind of look at the, the chance that you'll, you'll make it partway down, etc. Uh, especially in the legal system, in particular, we do, as, as mentioned, lawyers do this all the time, but the, the very idea of legal precedent uh, is in and of itself a slippery slope. Uh, and judges have a tendency to sometimes create exceptions or to make new rules if existing ones aren't fair or don't appear to be fair. And the, way the fact that precedent works this way can cloud our issue on whether or not, one, this is a fallacy at all, and especially when applied to specific issues, whether or not a particular argument is a uh, logical fallacy uh, or whether or not it is in fact a valid way of approaching things. So the mere point that you're, it, you know, if you're take discussing something outside of a, a, an area that could establish a legal precedent, you know, that's one thing. But if, you, if you're in a court case or, or in a, a uh, discussion that could be argued in a court case, so you know, if you're on some internet thread somewhere, if you're making an argument that someone could take that argument and actually put it in front of a judge, uh, whether or not they attribute it to you or not, then this could actually uh, kind of take off on its own. You could kind of fly down the slope. A as mentioned, uh, you're going to have to make a decision at any point in this slope, uh, kind of where you are and uh, where what direction you should be going. And as we've discussed in the argument to the beer, that decision is going to be, to a large extent, uh, kind of arbitrary. And somebody has to make the decision. And when you make the decision, uh, it's probably going to be painfully obvious that it's an arbitrary decision. And, you know, who made the decision was the person who made the decision with their biases and interests and so on. And so this is going to be kind of an unstable consensus and uh, that you're, you're going to be stuck making it no matter where you make it. Uh, but the good news of that is that you can sometimes flip the situation around in that if you're here uh, and you don't like 
you know, the, this uh, hell situation, uh, you could make the, the other, or make the argument that you should go back a step. And often enough, you can frame the argument, and we'll, again, have examples of this as we go. It's worth thinking about how these kinds of arguments can work. Uh, this video is an attempt at convincing you that it's important, uh, but if you go deeper into statistics, I encourage you to go and try to look at, in practice, what the statistics kind of tell us about this situation. Because the risks involved, going to hell in this case, uh, is ex can be extremely big. Uh, and they can be uh, kind of species ending. When we talk about existential risk, uh, you know, when humanity can be wiped out, you only need a very, very small percentage of that uh, chance actually being real realistic uh, to justify substantial investments to prevent it. Uh, and so understanding how this kind of argument can work and how these kinds of situations can happen uh, can pay off in the long run. Part of the problem with slippery slopes and part of the reason that people are so skeptical of them is, as we've kind of mentioned with the fallacy of the beard, is how unstable every point on this slope is and how there is some probability that we'll, we'll fall to the next step. And especially for moving down already, uh, we can kind of see the trajectory as we go uh, and kind of gauge uh, in general how far we're going to go. Now that doesn't necessarily mean we will fall to the next step on the slope, but at least it gives us a way to look at it and to kind of predict the future, even though it's not certain. So for an example of this kind of slope-like problem is the problem of addiction. And there's a lot of people who will go back and forth saying, you know, if you start here, you know, if you start with, say, marijuana uh, or alcohol, uh, you will be tempted to do other drugs. And so, for example, mushrooms uh, are, are something that I, I've known a lot of people who have tried it, uh, especially among the, the potheads that I've known. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily that bad for you. Uh, most people don't do it more than once or twice. Uh, but nevertheless, there's probably a good argument to be made that people who try pot uh, will try mushrooms, likely. Uh, and then th the problem is, is that people who try you know, things, pot and mushrooms, often than not try other things. Uh, so, for example, um, ecstasy. So. And then people who try pot drug or pot mushrooms and ecstasy uh, will try, you know, other drugs. Let's say, um, what, what's the horse tranquilizer one? Whatever that one is. And then you kind of go down the road until eventually you're, you know, prostituting yourself for heroin. And at the very bottom. And of course, we all want to avoid that. So, at some point, you have to, you know, kind of gauge. Uh, should we not smoke pot at all because we don't want this terrible, terrible outcome to happen? And, but if you actually look at the data, uh, and even among harder drug users, uh, there's a lot of stopping points that you wouldn't necessarily know existed unless you were in a community that's affected by these problems uh, and by drug addiction in general. And so you can see these stopping points where people say only use it on the weekends or only use it, a, you know, a certain amount, a couple of days. I don't know what the stopping points are, but I do know that there's at least six or seven of them that uh, in communities where this kind of problem has gone very, very far down the slope, it just stops for the vast majority of people. And then after that point, there's still some people who fall further, but they tend to have uh, other mental illnesses and other problems that kind of cause them and, and a lack of stability in their life. Which brings us to the, the next point, which is that there are these stable points. And so you can't necessarily predict that you'll fall entirely down the slope. And again, this is why people think it's a fallacy, because there are these often enough stable points that you can stop at and often get back up the slope. And it's not a sur sure thing that you'll fall the entire way down the slope, as long as there's at least one point where you're likely to bounce back, and at least as likely to fall as you are to climb back up. And so many people do, in fact, recover from, from drug addiction, going all the way down to the opiates and heroin. Uh, obviously not everybody does, and it's not something that you should play with, uh, but again, if, if you're worried about everyone who starts at the top making their way to the bottom, 
that's an unreasonable worry, uh, even in something as serious as addiction. So what are pro some things that, or qualities or properties that these kinds of slopes have? So the first, as mentioned, is the probability from one step to another, or from one point of the slope to another. There's going to be, even if you don't know it, some chance that you'll make it from one point in the slope to another, from one event happening to another. And this is something that if you're dealing with a situation like this, you could at least do your best to try to plot out, even if you don't know them exactly. See if you can just you know, create an, an estimation. It could be 50 plus or minus 50%. That's fine. You know, at least explicitly state it be, so that when you're disagreeing with someone on these probabilities that you can kind of disagree on the level of probability and not necessarily on a level where you have no way of resolving your difference. Because there are ways of resolving differences of opinion on two or on an event where both people believe that the event has different probabilities of happening. I've covered some of them in the 10 Ideas 50 Years series, but regardless of whether you know them or not, this is a first step to get out of this kind of situation. You can look for mitigating factors or these stable points or, or forces that might cause you to move back up the slope or forces that might cause the slope to no longer be as steep. You know, that there, there may be, uh, uh, again, uh, things that are so bad that it may be worth kind of ignoring how steep the slope is, but the, the third thing that slopes are going to have is a steepness to them, or, or, or a slipperiness to them, to say, you know, how, if you start on one side, what is the chance that you will keep moving? Even if, you're kind of ignoring the probability of being in each stage relative to each other stage, there may be kind of a momentum that you can have. And so, again, if, if, if you can kind of measure that, that's something worth kind of pointing out explicitly. We can measure the amount of control we have. So not only the, the amount of momentum that we, we have going up and down the slope, not only the amount of kind of likelihood that we'll be in any particular state given how, you know, which state we're in, but how much actual agency or control or how much choice do we have whether or not we keep kind of moving in one direction or whether or not we, we kind of start moving back up the slope. If we can prove that our amount of choice that we have drops as we go down, that's not a good thing. If we can prove that we have full choice as we go down, whether or not we come back up again, even though our choice is kind of, uh, it looks like we should be making that choice or something like that, at least that's something. And so we can always kind of keep an eye on whether or not we still have the choice to stop. Uh, we also, one last property that this slope is going to have is on what level of discourse is this slope happening in? So, for example, are you merely in a slippery slope between your actions and maybe your friend's actions? So, if, you know, if you go to the movies one day, maybe you'll, uh, it'll be harder to say, you know, no, I don't want to go see the movies the next day. And then sooner or later, you're going to see the movies all the time. And then finally, you're, you know, running out of money because you've spent all your money on movies. Well, I mean, that's something that you're, you're just in a circle of friends, and it's just kind of a social convention thing. So, it, it's not really a, a, you know, you're not, it's not illegal to not go to the movies. It's just hard to get out of going to the movies. Whereas, if, for example, uh, we're talking about, you know, the law in the United States, and if they make it a law that you have to drink your, you know, Mountain Dew every 15 minutes while you're watching a movie, otherwise you're charged with piracy, well, that's a law, and you know the, the law tends to have a lot of uh, resources that uh, can be uh, brought down upon you if you don't follow it. And it's very difficult to change a law in the United States because there are these there's this huge bureaucracy. You have to write the law in a certain way and have a whole bunch of people in these certain buildings kind of agree with you on the wording. And you have to hope to God that there isn't some kind of a political disagreement going on that they can kind of bargain your law against some other laws that may or may not have anything to do with you know, what you're trying to do, and so on and so forth. So, uh, it, it's, it's very uh, dependent on whether or not you're, you're dealing with something where the, the, the context itself is very simple, or very large and involved, and involving a lot of people. What are ways that a slippery slope can come into effect? Uh, 
if it's a completely deterministic thing uh, that A always follows B, or at least follows B uh, in a purely physical sense, um, then that's not necessarily uh, a, a slippery slope kind of a per se. That, that's just a process that can lead to another process. And so uh, there's going to be kind of a middle ground between things that are entirely probabilistic and things that can be caused by chance and then things that are going to happen regardless. Uh, and there's kind of a middle ground there. And, and on both sides of that spectrum, you're going to have, you know, one side's going to be or, or viewing things in terms of a slippery slope on one side is going to be a logical fallacy, and viewing things in terms of the other is just going to be looking at a process in, in action, uh, and the middle ground is not going to be clear which of which you're kind of dealing with. It could be that the changes between these two steps are so subtle that you don't even notice that they're happening until you're about halfway down the slope, at which point you can't control or you've lost control of whether or not you're moving at all. So, for example, uh, the uh, you know the, the first couple of, of, of steps in Ukraine uh, during the, the most recent kind of crisis there uh, really just seemed like pro protests you'd see anywhere else in the world. Uh, there were you know college students, maybe some you know, old grannies or something like that, and you know you probably would just ignore them. And then the next group comes to protest, and you probably just ignore them too, because again, protests happen in democracy. And even in uh, places that don't have very good functioning democracies, they still happen, and you, you can most of the time think that they won't succeed or anything like that. But after you get to a certain point, the protests are so big that you can't ignore them anymore, and then things start happening. Uh, in that case, the government got disposed, and now the whole country is in the middle of a civil war. But again, it's, it's something that you wouldn't necessarily see happening or expect to get as far as it gotten uh, right away because the changes themselves are too subtle. Uh, it could be that the changes involved change the people who are involved. And so uh, I if you're uh, kind of changing the way you look at the world, uh, you could get to the point where the next step allows you to make the next step, uh, the e even if you would not have made this step had you not gotten to this middle point. As kind of mentioned, th there's kind of a momentum that can, you can build, where it looks like, for example, you're being successful in making changes. Uh, the NRA apparently had a, a, a bunch of winning streaks in, I think it was the 70s or so, where they, they happened to pass some laws or oppose some laws, and it looked like they were going to do quite well uh, until they, they eventually got stopped and the momentum started going the other way. Uh, but in general, you, you can get into these sort of situations where you start moving down this chain faster and faster. It could be that the cost of further change is decreased. So it could be that if you, you know going from A to B is expensive, but going from B to C is not as expensive, and from C to D is not as expensive still. And you know, so for example, you could be buying capital that increases your ability to produce things that increases your ability to, to produce other things. So the, the slope of you being able to get some product made or something developed might be kind of lessened by your ability to develop similar things. It could be that the, your ability to think about the situation changes the further down the long line you go. And so if you can kind of force yourself to, to rethink your situation, uh, you may end up getting to a point where you can make different kinds of decisions. So for example, uh, we, the, you may not have thought um, that we'd be kind of discussing uh, global warming as much as we are uh, unless somebody had actually gone and done the research on global warming. Uh, I'm not going to get into two details on uh, what utility functions are, but if you have people with multiple uh, peaks in their utility functions, this can actually cause uh, a, a, an unstable slippery slope to happen. Uh, and you can also get to a point uh, if people's uh, utility functions are changed by where in the slope they are, uh, that you can fall down the slope as well. If people are irrational, then you can fall down a, a slippery slope. Uh, because uh, even if it's a bad idea to go from B to C or from C to D, uh, 
in general, uh, and if people don't recognize that it's a bad idea or are unable to reason properly about whether it's a bad idea, then chance, you know, that there's some likelihood that those people will take you there. People can learn about how to make something work. So, for example, if you're not really sure how to make the transition from B to C or C to D, uh, and you make it from A to B, and then you learn by doing so, learn how to do so, you can kind of take the next steps, either in a good or a bad way. People can get exposed to consequences uh, and then think, well, that's not bad, uh, and then kind of continue down the line. So as kind of discussed in the, in the dr drug example, uh, a lot of people, myself included, uh, have been warned not to partake in marijuana because there are all these nasty consequences that don't actually end up materializing. And so we get kind of acclimatized to that and are willing to take the next step uh, if only justified on the fact that there was no consequences for the first one. The problem, of course, is down the line somewhere here, there are definitely consequences for the drugs that you put into yourself, and it can be very dangerous to do so. Uh, but uh, if you become acclimatized to the consequences, and whether you're mistaken about the nature of the consequences or not, you can get to this point where you're willing to take the next step. You can screw up when you evaluate the consequences, uh, as kind of mentioned just just now. You, you can think that the consequences were not that bad, when in fact, I, actually, they were that bad. And who knows, maybe I've got some brain, you know, brain damage or something like that. I, I personally don't see it, uh, but it's entirely possible. Uh, another example of that is I, uh, at one point, when I first graduated university, uh, got into, I think it was apples to apples, and I said something along the lines of, well, the university wasn't that bad. And then one of my friends kind of sl almost slapped me and said, you know, Jeff, you were in it for how many years and you had, you know, struggled that far through it. Uh, that is not what you would have said even two weeks ago, uh, which is true. And, you know, I, I, I misread the consequences of my going to university at that point. Uh, a lot of the time, you only consider options that you're told about, and you don't consider options that you're not told about. And the, the slippery part might be entirely uh, in the e either uh, kind of considering, well, yeah, so, so you may not even know that the, these are options that you can kind of go on until you get partway down the line. There's that. But there's also the fact that whether or not you think you can rationally deal with, uh, you know, taking the next steps or, or not taking the next steps, sometimes your subconscious mind, if it's aware of them, will kind of stew on it and, and think about doing it whether or not you want to do so consciously. And there is something called bounded rationality, which I'll, I'll talk maybe a, a little bit more about in a later video or something, uh, but you're only capable of making so much choices and being so informed when you're making those choices, and sometimes that can cause you to slide down. There's something called the, uh, the persistence heuristic, uh, which is that you can learn to, to stick to the plan more. You can increase your grit uh, as you make choices and as you stick to your choices. And sometimes it's that sticking to your choices that kind of forces you down the, the, the slope. Sometimes there are parts where there are stable points. And then there are the rest, the entire rest of the slope is very unstable. So if you can get into kind of one part of the, the slope, you'll probably slide very quickly down to the next stable point. And then the question is, where are those stable points? In democracies, you'll find this a lot because the voting public disagrees with themselves. Uh, it's a diver sometimes a, a very diverse or multicultural group with a lot of different interests, uh, and it doesn't necessarily consider things uh, in, in the best way. Uh, and sometimes the, the middle ground makes no sense at all, uh, even if the, the, the two end points at least make some sense to some people. Uh, and so you'll get a lot of people pushing you away from the middle ground. Uh, and of course, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a small group, an individual with kind of multiple in, you know, interests and multiple goals and desires, or an entire nation, the same thing can apply. It could be that the middle ground costs a lot to administer. Uh, there's a lot of issues like that where you'll be kind of pushed to one stable point or the other uh, based purely on administrative costs alone. 
it could be that the middle ground incurs a lot of computational costs uh, and that it takes a lot of thinking to stay in the middle ground and to know, as, as we've discussed in the fallacy of the beard, kind of where in the middle ground you are or whether or not you're moving. It could be that it, your ability to be in a certain point in this slope uh, depends on your uh, ability to uh, formulate rules or general rules or principles that put you at a certain point. Uh, I, Eugene Bullock, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, made a good point that uh, quote unquote intellectual property unquote uh, rules uh, often are reinforced by rulings in courts, uh, but the exceptions to those rules are not. And so you can get into situations where general rules themselves are reinforced by what you do, but the exceptions to those rules are not. And so you're, you're over time kind of reinterpreting your situation uh, to, m to be more expressed in those kinds of rules rather than a more informed viewpoint, informed by not just the general rule, but the exceptions to it. Of course, it's hard to keep in mind both the general rule and a whole long litany of exceptions at all times, so sometimes we just kind of ex forget that the exceptions are there, and we just focus on the rule. And then, of course, we slide further down the line because the rule is more extreme, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Does the outcome kind of enable social clumping? Do one of the things that people do is we form groups. We form uh, large groups and small groups, cohesive and not cohesive groups, and all of this can be affected by your your changes and what slopes you're on. You know, is the size of the group determined by uh, where on this slope you are? Is the cohesiveness of the group determined by where in this slope you are? Uh, is the amount of power each individual in the group versus the entire group or the entire group itself have depend on where you are on the slope? Any of these things can push you one way or the other up many different types of slopes. Uh, there's a paper by Julian Assange called Conspiracy is Governance, uh, which is probably worth a read. Uh, which discusses how information processing in groups kind of causes their groups to behave differently. And the more efficient and more information uh, you're able to process, the more uh, you know, certain properties groups will uh, have. Uh, and so if your uh, slippery slope that you're on depends on uh, the kinds of things that Julian Assange talks about uh, in terms of how efficient you are at dealing with information as a group, then again, that'll be something that you can go up and down a many a slippery slope as your ability to information or to ability to process information changes depending on certain things. Anything that changes the amount or nature of immigration or movement from one group into another will change uh, often involve slippery slopes in democracies where those groups have voting rights or the ability to change rules in a society that they live in. Uh, it may be that some changes make further changes more interesting. And so it may be kind of boring to consider, for example, 10 years ago, the possibility of using, say, Twitter. Uh, it would have seemed, or maybe not 10 years ago, say 20 years ago, it may have seemed kind of silly and not all that interesting to do it until the idea of taking pictures of your food became popular. And then that would suddenly mean that we could then tweet our, our pictures of our food and so on and so forth. And so if you can make life more interesting by moving down a slope, uh, then sometimes it becomes more likely that you'll keep moving. If there's a difference in the ability of groups to, co to compromise or their willingness to compromise, uh, or where extremists have control over groups, uh, to a lesser or greater degree, depending on where you are on the slope, you may move up and down the slope. Uh, for example, in the United States, uh, Democrats and Republicans have been growing more extreme from each other. Uh, specifically, Republicans have been uh, kind of growing more and more extreme as we go, and that has implications on not just the policies that govern political poli politics in the states, uh, but who ends up succeeding and to what degree. Uh, a lot of people have kind of a heuristic that if something bad happens once, then a rule always has to be made to remedy it and to make it better, even if the rules that currently govern the situation are, are meant to be interpreted in a statistical way 
and that existing rules already cover the case, but only cover it to say a 99.9% .9 chance. Uh, and so what will happen in those cases is people will start to add rules and they'll add rules that are kind of double counting uh, the effects that they are, are meant to govern and but nevertheless the, the, the total number of rules will continue to increase and this is another case where you can get into a slippery slope because you're not really taking into account the evidence that might bump you up the line and so you'll get this kind of ratcheting effect where you keep going further and further down the line. Uh, if goodwill is involved, or if the, the belief that other people are by their nature good and to be trusted by default, uh, if that belief or the probability involved is uh, changed depending where in this slope you can be, then again, you can move up and down this slope. Because if you start eroding goodwill, then people will stop kind of trusting each other, and that will cause a cascading effect where people will trust each other less and less and less. But again, there may be stable points, so keep in mind that the, those stable points may exist. As we discussed in, uh, I think it was the bandwagon video, or bandwagon argument video, the Ash conformity test is intrinsically a slippery slope. So if you can convince, say, N people uh, that that line is as long as you want them to believe it, then the next person is just one more person that you can convince by that effect. And so anywhere where the Ash conformity experiment would apply, anywhere where there's a bandwagon argument that could apply, then you're basically already on a slippery slope that will lead you not necessarily to good places. It could be that you're associating meaning on a different level. Uh, so for example, you're more likely to uh, kind of pick a choice uh, where you're, there's an association on the level of words where uh, then if there isn't, or if there's an association at the level of kind of looks compared to where there isn't. And so there, there's all these kind of higher levels of meaning that could predispose you to one thing or another. And if that changes the further down you go, again, it may be a slippery slope. As kind of hinted on in the immigration comment, uh, any, demographic, any demographic changes can very quickly become a slippery slope. So for example, if nobody under 18 starts smoking, and there's a su significant social effect causing people to only smoke if their peers smoke, then uh, when those 18-year-olds turn 19, they'll probably still not smoke. And when those 19-year-olds turn 40, they'll probably still not smoke. And at the end of the day, you'll get to a point where most people just don't smoke because their peers didn't smoke. And so that's kind of a, uh, an example of a demographic change that's slow, but still, you get to these kind of extreme cases uh, in that case, it would actually be a good case. Uh, but again, it's, it would be not necessarily viewed as good from a ta tobacco company perspective. Uh, if the change itself is exponential or self-referential, most of these changes happen because there's a kind of feedback loop being kind of expressed, where uh, ch the change causes f further change to happen. And we've talked a little bit about exponential growth, but again, anywhere where there's exponential change, this can be kind of interpreted. Anywhere where you're changing the rules uh, can cause further changes of the rules. So if, if we give, say, 17-year-olds the right to vote, they'll have the incentive to make other changes to laws that may, for example, make it more in their interest to vote 16-year-olds to have the right to vote as well. And so anything where you can kind of play with the rules to allow you to play with the rules more deeply can be a slippery slope. Uh, as we discussed in the argument at Vacuum video, uh, if you're using force and your power is maintained purely on the perception of your force that you're using, then if you look weak, then people will come at you and your power won't necessarily help you as much as it otherwise might. And so if you're not actually more powerful than your opponent, then you can fall very, very rapidly uh, by the perception of weakness and the possible perception of weakness and the, the, the ability of people to even possibly get you to look weak. Uh, you, you can very quickly fall. And the last kind of thing worth noting, uh, other than addiction, which we've already talked about, uh, is changes to your risk preferences. Uh, if your risk preferences can change from one step to the other, you may be more willing to take risks or less willing to take risks. 
and in both cases you can get into more uh, complicated situations the further you go. So if you're stuck fighting against someone who's using a slippery slope argument, see if you can flip around the slope. See if you can try to convince them that, the that you're falling the other way. Sometimes you can pull this off, and again, we'll, we'll have a, uh, an example as we go. Make explicit what kind of slope you're falling on, and what causes you expect to be operating that might cause you to fall down it. Make explicit where you find the stable points to be, and where you expect there to not be stable points when you're discussing a slippery slope. If risk preferences are involved, or any of the things we've mentioned as kind of causes of these slopes, discuss them, and discuss them openly, and see if they're actually involved, or if you can agree with the person you're talking to that they're actually involved. It's related to the, if I'm pronouncing it right, the Abilene Paradox. Uh, where group decisions can be made that nobody actually wants to make if everyone in the group thinks that the group wants to make it. Uh, so if you're in a situation like that, uh, you can make bad decisions as a group that can lead to worse decisions. Uh, Eugene Bullock, if, again if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, made the point that there's a slippery slope inefficiency involved with group decision making where you can get stuck in these middle group or stuck where you, everyone would prefer the middle step, or where there's a large public benefit to be in the middle step, but the middle step is an unstable point on the road to some horrible outcome on both sides, uh, depending who you are in the group. And so people will prefer not to take that next step if they kind of fear uh, further change. If you can defeat that in inefficiency, sometimes you can get a lot of benefit from it. But again, you have to be careful because sometimes you can get, uh, you, you'll just fall right through and you won't build up the institutions uh, that you need to stop you from falling further. Uh, Volok uh, suggested a couple of ways that you can stop this kind of inefficiency from happening. Uh, for example, you can have higher level rules that govern the situation. So if you're dealing with a personal matter, uh, if there are you know, laws in your city or, or conventions in your group that are explicitly encoded, uh, you might be able to stop any middle point and go no further. Uh, you could have a constitutional law in your country that makes you likely to not go further than a stable point, and so on. Uh, you can not double check your guesses. Uh, so if you make it to a certain point, don't look into it any further. Accept that you're in that certain point and, and kind of don't kick the hornet's nest if you suspect you could fall further. Uh, and the, the kind of culture of doing that may actually help in these slippery slope situations. Of course, there may be reasons to kick the hornet's nest and to examine your situation for other reasons, but at least in this particular case, uh, it may help. If you have to make a movement, make a movement with both sides of an argument appearing that they don't lose face. Uh, appearing that they've won would be best. Uh, appearing that they haven't lost anything, or, or appearing that the, they've lost something and won something at the same time is at least almost as good. So if you can make it just so that nobody gains political momentum when you're making decisions, Sometimes you can get to the point where you can kind of gauge where on this slope you should be purely on the merits of every step uh, alone and on its costs and its benefits alone, which is, of course, where we want to be. We want to be in the best spot on this slope, not necessarily based on whether or not we can fall up or down the slope, but based on whether or not we would want to be on that slope on its own merits. Uh, the, the, the last way of getting to this is because when you're dealing with this, a lot of the times, uh, and, and kind of as mentioned, you're dealing with irrational people anyway, uh, it can be justified to use kind of underhanded means of going up and down the slope. Uh, but you have to be really careful when you do this because, one, if you get caught doing this, then, uh, you know, people won't respect you at all. Uh, and of course, two, that makes you a bad person probably by even, you know, trying to do that. 
Uh, but again, if you're not explicitly uh, doing so in a way that counteracts irrational behavior, you're actually making the situation worse by doing that. And so be very, very careful while you're doing that, although that may actually be one way of getting up and down the slope, and one way of removing this inefficiency and actually making groups uh, able to make decisions in a way that is actually better for everyone in the group. Uh, one, one kind of last uh, point uh, is that if you can point out that the slippery slope is there, and if you can get people to see it, that often enough makes a stable point on its own. People will recognize that, hey, you know, things could get worse in a hurry. Maybe we should be careful what we do on this issue. The existence of groups like the ACLU and the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and the EFF um, all kind of point out that there are things that can go horribly, horribly wrong in an advanced uh, technological society. And so their mere existence as someone to point out at every point on this slope, hey, we've gone down a point, it could get worse, uh, often enough is, is in and of itself a force pushing us the other way, even if they fail at any particular point on the slope. I was going to have some examples, but it looks like this video is long enough. Um, but rest assured, if you look, uh, the, for example, the Huffington Post has a whole section dedicated to these things. And if you look for them, you will find them. And often enough, you're, you're faced with a situation like this because you don't trust the other people that you're talking to, or the, uh, the other members of your group, or the out group, or something like that. And of course, they probably don't trust you either. And so the problem, a lot of the time, isn't even that you're on this slippery slope at all. Even though you probably wouldn't want to admit it, the problem is that mutual mistrust. And if you can fix that problem, you can get to the point on this slope that is most advantageous for all parties. But if you can't get to that point, then you might just slip all the way down. And so it's really important to treat people with respect, to not necessarily use underhanded means, even if you think it's a good idea, uh, unless, again, there's no other way of dealing with the situation. And, of course, just increase your empathy to other people, increase your ability to work with other people when you can, and increase their ability to work with you, because that'll save you from these kinds of situations. And as, as kind of a last note, uh, there's a, a, a quote, there's a lot of natural resting places for the mind. Uh, human beings generate drama exponentially and fractally. You, at every point of this line, you can point to it and say, yeah, that's a point where drama happens. Uh, and you can always get to the point where there's a way to oppose the status quo and keep the status quo. And there's a, a lot of the time it's going to be these kind of resting points and stable points that you don't necessarily expect are there, but are there because of the drama involved and because of drama between and inside groups that keeps things uh, from moving efficiently, whether downhill a slope or not. And so at, at, as the point of that is, is that if you're at a point where you don't like, chances are the drama involved, whether by your actions or not, will eventually budget one way or another. This too shall pass, right? It doesn't matter where you are, what slope you're on, chances are at some point it's going to be, you know, it's going to end or you're going to move to a different point on the slope. Uh, so don't fret about it too much. Increase your empathy for other human beings. You know, be a good person and help other people understand the world and help people with their struggles and their points on their slippery slopes so that when you need help, they'll be there for you, and they won't necessarily drag you down with them. So, uh, as usual, if you'd like to uh, suggest uh, a uh, something that I've said will lead to your going to hell uh, on any uh, comment thread where this video is posted, feel free to post it. Uh, I will uh, be here to answer your questions. This series of videos is for you, the, the listener. Uh, and uh, as usual, there should be a little Bitcoin donation address for you to donate to. So, uh, hopefully you enjoy. See you next video.